Hello, welcome back to a highlights compilation of another hack of FE8, The Sacred Stones. This hack is made by Vesley of Poke Emblem fame, and the difference. Well, weapons and healing items have infinite uses, sure, but the main difference is that if you end your turn, any blue units that haven't yet acted act according to AI control. The idea for this run is to see how well the AI will do while I control only the lords, without resetting for deaths unless I think it's really egregious. So, mostly a soft Iron Man. The prologue happens basically entirely as it normally would, except for the fact that Seth obviously runs off to heal rather than killing an enemy, as you would normally make him do for the one turn clear of this map. Chapter 1, Escape, demonstrates the main issue with frail units in general in this hack, but especially frail units that have high move. They overextend, and then die. Franz is mathematically meant to die on this map due to the combination of the two soldiers, Brigette and the Axe Fighter, which is unfortunate. In the first attempt, this isn't even a problem exclusive to high move frail units, even Gilliam can cavalierly charge off to his death, depending on how long it takes for Seth to return from killing the reinforcements. Erica dying here in this first attempt is the main reason why I decided that I'm allowed to control both Erica and later Ephraim. On the second attempt where I do control Erica, only Franz dies, so I decided to just continue on without him because I don't think he was going to continue to live for particularly long either way. It's a bit unfortunate that due to being part of the trade tutorial in the easy mode of the base game, we've lost an infinite use 10 HP recovery item, and we are therefore one healing item short for our current full roster. Still, in Chapter 2, The Protected, this is quickly remedied by the closest village giving us an infinite use elixir. The management of elixirs is very important to the survival of our units. We continue to see more AI moments, like the choice to have our healer run straight into danger. Unsurprisingly, Ross dies on turn 1 enemy phase, meaning that we never get to recruit Garcia. Garcia does at least get to revenge his son though, so that's nice. Gilliam once again charges straight off into danger despite his low move, and still doesn't have a healing item, so I trade him over Erica's Vaughn, because I do think that if any of this lot not called Seth will survive, it's him. After chapter 2, I give the elixir to Seth because he's the best unit here, so I want him to survive. He's also a mounted unit of 8 move, so he's going to be seeing a lot of combat, so once he does start to get damaged, into healing AI range, I don't think a 10 HP vulnerary recovery will be enough to tide him over. We also go shopping for javelins, which are obscenely cheap, as are all weapons actually, because the cost seems to be calculated as though they are single use. Chapter 3, The Bandits of Borgo, is very uneventful, highlighting that the early part of this run will be the Seth's solo show with javelin. That makes this a pretty standard FE8 playthrough, albeit with more death. I also decide that I can control people for unit recruitment purposes, though I do later realise that I would always have been able to play this map because Green Unit Con would have opened up all the doors anyway. In Chapter 4, Ancient Horrors, Artur dies incredibly quickly to the Bone Walker reinforcements from the right hand side of the map. Luke joins at the end of the map, which I previously didn't know would happen. Still, due to her frailty, I don't think she'll be sticking around for that long either. Chapter 5, The Empire's Reach gives us the start of Natasha's whirlwind romance with Loot, in the form of her trying to heal her with an infinite use men's staff even though Loot is not injured. Very romantic. It also gives us multiple deaths. First of all, in a classic frail high move AI moment, Vanessa flies into range of an archer and dies. Seth doesn't double Joshua, so he doesn't kill him, and because of the weird AI priorities, Seth doesn't kill him during the following player phase, but rather another enemy. This means that Mulder moves into range with his kind of aggressive AI as a healer, and then gets crit killed. It's okay though, because Seth then goes and actually kills Joshua before he can killing edge crit kill anyone else. Oh, also Naomi died, but I think that was a foregone conclusion. She will not be especially missed. Throughout all of this, Erica goes and visits as many villages as she can, which isn't that many, though we prioritise the Draco shield because god knows we need some defence. Seth's move means that even with the strange AI priorities, he simply moves too far for her to be able to visit them all, so we miss out on the Guiding Ring. Not that we would be able to use it anyway. Chapter 5x, Unbroken Heart, is not that interesting, just like in vanilla. Though Ford dies, since both he and Kyle play on casual mode on this map, this death is only temporary. What is, however, more interesting, and torturous, is Chapter 6, Victims of War. I bring along everyone who's still alive. Loot and Natasha continue to court each other, and due to starting position, Colm is killed very quickly by the Cavaliers to the north. Still, for the most part, 
nobody really does much until the cavalry reinforcements appear, at which point nobody really does much again, because they all die. Rest in peace, girlfriends. Except not, because Erica also dies, so they get to live again. Attempt 2 sees Erica die on, like, turn 2, after getting hit by two soldiers while standing in a forest, making me decide that she needs the Chapter 5 Dragon Shield. In Attempt 3, I learn that the AI cheats in fog. Despite me thinking that Gillian would be tanky enough, he still eventually dies because the Vaughn doesn't heal him for enough. Due to all the enemies scattered about, including the reinforcements from behind, Seth runs away from Erica, which makes me worried for a bit. Eventually though, he does return. Everything is going well, meaning I would have left Gillian dead, until I overextended and Erica died. Attempts 4 and 5 are more of me overextending and getting Erica killed. I overextend a bit less on attempt 6, so at last we have a fight, another map clear about anyone's permanent death, because I underpoint everyone apart from Erica and Seth. This pattern of no permanent deaths doesn't last long, however. Chapter 7, Waterside Renville, sees the deaths of all of Colm, Loot, and Natasha. Colm and Loot could not take the two random enemies up to the top left on their own, and Natasha decides to no longer stick to her girlfriend, then to follow her in death. A truly tragic romance story for the ages. Gilliam once again almost dies, but everything turns out fine, meaning that I have more units than just the Lord and the Jagan. Chapter 8 is a trap, sees the number of my units double from 3 to 6. I'll bait for like, one turn, before Frail Cav Ford dies, shortly followed by tankier Cav Kyle. Due to the placement of the door to the treasure chest room to the right hand side, Gilliam and especially Seth end up running towards the left. Erica thus has to follow them, because she can't take all the knights in the room on her own. As a result, the map devolves into a long slog through the left side, followed by going around to the right to get the angelic robe for some extra bulk. Gilliam once again nearly dies, this time on Torado, but he discovers a self-preservation instinct and lives. Steps will be taken to make sure this doesn't happen again anytime soon. At the route split, I decide to go on Erica's route. This is because in the Oops All Archers Evolved LTC, I decided to go on Ephraim's route, so it would be nice to get some variety. Also, I really don't trust the AI to complete its phantom ship, even with both Seth and Dussel. The reason why we will not be seeing more Gilliam near deaths again is because, at this point, I decide that it is acceptable to go to the tower for a Gilliam training arc. I wanted the AI to control at least one other non-Seth unit, because I thought it would be more interesting that way. I get him to level 20 in the tower before promoting him into a general according to voice call demand. In hindsight, this was probably also actually the smart play, since the low move means that he won't end up dramatically ahead of Erica. He will be training in axes, as Gorm's speed bonus will be very helpful most likely, so I just give him a hand axe. Chapter 9a, Distant Blade, sees the joining of yet another new unit in the form of Tana. I don't have high hopes for her survival, but I remove all of her weapons in the hope that this means her AI won't make her move towards enemies. It does, and so she dies, including nearly dying to an archer on turn 1 enemy phase. Unsurprisingly, we don't get either village. Amelia doesn't get recruited, but rather retreats. I probably could have gotten her and so taken her speed wing off of her, but I couldn't be bothered. Chapter 10a, Revolt at Carcino, actually gives us new units that survive their joining chapter, thank goodness. All of Inez, Garrick, and Tephis are recruited and so survive this map. Unfortunately, the AI doesn't understand the concept of dancing, so Tephis is just kind of… here? At the very least, she's generous enough to bring us an elixir for our troubles, which will be very handy. Not recruited is Marissa, whose shamshir I did want for Erica, as she is able to use it. I was going to have Garrick talk to her to recruit her, but then he got hit by the sleep staff, so I just had Erica kill her. Also, as a result of Garrick getting slept, we get to see the AI once again cheating by having him move and try to attack someone, albeit unsuccessfully. After the completion of 10A, we once again return to the tower, this time for Garrick's training arc. After reaching 20, I promote him to a hero for 1-2 range access in the form of the Hand Axe and the lower move compared to Ranger. Despite the Hand Axe S, Garrick will be focusing on swords. Garm is already spoken for by Gilliam, and Seth already being at S Lances due to the Jav spam means that Autolma is not yet claimed. Chapter 11, Creeping Darkness, once again has the AI cheese in fog, especially Dozzler's green unit AI, causing him to go and kill an enemy in the fog on the first turn of ally phase. Once Seth locks onto the first enemy, the map once again becomes the Seth show, though the promoted gargoyle still lands enemy, does mean that he's at actual risk for once. Once that enemy is gone though, the rest of the map is a pretty leisurely stroll slowly towards the boss in the bottom left corner. Chapter 12, Village of Silence, gives us Saleh, and also a new AI moment where a good chunk of my units simply don't move on the first attempt. 
This is quickly remedied though by an Erica death and reload, meaning that everyone now actually starts moving again. Attempt 2 goes far smoother once Erica is both surrounded by more allies and I don't overextend her. Dozzler comes close to death from the Gargoyle reinforcement, including an Act Reaver one from the south, but the Autobots do eventually arrive back to save him. I decide to go and recruit Ewan, though I once again find out that he'll be recruited at the end of the map. The remaining portion of the map thus becomes a moment of having all of Erica, Gilliam and Seth outrun him so that he cannot suicide himself on to the last two enemies. In Chapter 13, Hammer Canyon, the Autobots are very focused on what I also consider to be the actual map objective, Kill Boss. I wait after killing most everyone else. Both Ewan and Tefeth do end up dying, so rest in peace orphan siblings. Due to being the weakest enemy, when Gilliam gets into range of her, Gilliam does kill Amelia, so also rest in peace Speedwing. Due to the other enemies having a propensity of killing themselves on the 1-2 range trio of Seth, Gilliam and Garrick, this means that eventually only the boss is left in the surroundings. This means that I am not able to recruit Cormag, specifically being off by two tiles of move due to the forest. But uh, he probably wasn't surviving anyway, so this is a better fate for him. Chapter 14a, Queen of White Dunes, is always a map that moves slowly, but it moves especially slowly when the AI does silly things. In order to speed up this process, I do decide to make Garrick open up the door, same with Gillian with his door, because otherwise simply nothing happens. Everyone does end up collecting around Erica, with the exception of Gillian, who ends up going on a solo run around a good chunk of the map. For a second, I do wonder if I'll have to fight a berserk to Gillian, but then the priest just straight up doesn't try to berserk him because of their pathetic berserk range. It would have been funny, but also someone would definitely have died if that had happened. I have Erica go and break down the Renak room wall, and everyone reconvenes around here. Renak is killed by the combination of Saleh and Gilliam while Seth faces down Carlisle, which is a match he does win. Chapter 15, Scorched Sand, gives us more AI moments. In attempt 1, Saleh gets an HP level, and then spends the turn after this re restoring himself to full HP with his elixir, while Inez, like his personality would suggest he would, gets himself archer boxed in while getting surrounded on all sides. Then he dies. Unsurprisingly, Noel gets completely obliterated. This attempt ends after Ephraim gets slept by a troubadour, then tries to attack things due to the strange AI moment from before with Garrick, and dies once the reinforcements from his area appear. In the take that does stick, this time it's Saleh who overextends and dies, and Inez who lives despite also extending, with yet another death for Noel. In this, I discover the legendary Kelek and Velta perimeters, which I believe is the AI thinking both boss units are especially dangerous and will move. So I do actually start to move units like Seth towards Kellogg. Inez slowly attempts to chip away at Volta with his longbow, while everyone else stands far away. This AI dawdling tendency does at least give me the opportunity to collect all of the desert items I consider important, like the Swift Soul, which I don't actually use at any point because it's a liability on anyone I can't control. Once again, I move Seth closer so he does most of the work, and then Inez rudely takes the boss kill. The very first two attempts of Chapter 16, Ruled by Madness, are very tragic. The first one ends on turn 3-ish, after Erica gets hit by two axes and a mage. Then attempt 2 ends in the deaths of literally everyone besides the twins, Seth and Garrick. First goes Larachelle, then Moa, then Dussel, then Inez, then Gilliam, then lastly Dozzler. While if I could have any two of the remaining non-Lord characters, it would be those two, as actual Lizard pointed out. I've simply spent too much time working on Gilliam specifically, who I have a soft spot for after the Oops All Archers Evolved LTC. As a result, I decide to once again go to the Tower of Oni for another grinding session, so that everyone can get some levels and hopefully not die. By the end, everyone gains at least a few levels, including Seth reaching level 20. During this process, Dozzle dies on the fifth floor, and I don't reset for him according to my previous rules. This means that when the end cards do show, he'll have the ignominious end line of died on Tower of Volney 5. The third attempt of Chapter 16 goes much better. Far, few, far fewer people die, with Dussel coming close to, but ultimately avoiding death, and only one death in the form of Lara Shell, which is very acceptable, as almost everyone has an elixir in their inventory anyway, and she healed Dussel as a very important action before she died. She survived for much longer than I was expecting her to, so I'm very impressed. Naturally, both Erica and Ephraim promote at the end of the map, having already hit level 20 beforehand due to being the only units that can actually control the movements of. During the map, I have Ephraim rescue Mur, so that we can gr Volney grind her. This is because the Dragonstone has infinite uses, so once she is trained, she'll be a very hard-hitting, bulky unit who shouldn't fold to everything. This obviously isn't the case though prior to her training arc, so she got killed very quickly by a warrior during attempt 1. Mur's training arc in the tower ends up giving us a pretty standard Mur with a pretty non-standard weapon. Initially, the idea was going to be to go through the full tower, 
Until I remember that starting from Volney 2, there are some archers, and she does still take flying effective damage. Though, during the process of reading this, I realised that I also already had the Felice shield, and so could have given it to her. So while after this realisation, I do just stick to Volney 1 for the grind, it gives us a funny moment where similarly to the Volta perimeter in Chapter 15, both the Bonewalker archers and Murr try to outrange each other and thus achieve nothing. Chapter 17, River of Regrets, ends up being a very uneventful map, especially for Garrick, who literally just stands in the same place the whole map doing nothing, while Murr draws fire from the enemies that appear from the north and west. This means that none of the river folk get killed, so we get a rescue staff that we can't use, which is nice, I guess? Also, Serene survives to the end of the map, so we have yet another frail flyer. Surely, she will survive to the end of the game. Once again, like in the Oops All Archers LTC, Chapter 18, Two Faces of Evil, decides to be a source of great pain. The AI straight up decides to do nothing while all the eggs hatch, which I think is the shadow shot moment, meaning that they don't want to move the units into rain. This unfortunately means that non-supported Ephraim and Erica need to individually go off and do as much as they can against the huge army of Gorgons, while no one else does anything for a good while. When the map finally ends, I am very, very happy. In Chapter 19, Last Hope, I decide to be kind to myself and clear it the easy way by having Erica simply sit on the throne rescuing Mansell. During this, I occasionally forget about the end turn command moving her since I've been making her move this entire play, meaning that she sometimes ends up moving when I forget to make her wait. Still though, completely fine. Chapter 20, Darkling Woods, ends up being very manageable, not least because of the infinite use of monster effective weapons on all of the twins, Seth, Gilliam, Garrick, Inez, and Moa, and of course, all of the infinite use elixirs. There's really not much to say other than that Cyrene dies on turn 2 enemy phase due to once again overextending and being frail. I was initially surprised that she survived for as long as she did, but also she didn't do anything in chapter 18, and I didn't employ her in chapter 19, so... I guess it's not surprising at all in hindsight. Because everyone else keeps on getting distracted by the 100 plus reinforcements, Ephraim ends up being the one to kill both Reeve with the Spear, and Morva with the Sigmund. Then Erica Caesars to bring us to the finale, Sacred Stone. Unsurprisingly, despite having the Sacred Twins, the Draco Zombies continue to be threatening enemies since they're only double effective against monsters. Somewhat unfortunately, Garrick ends up triggering the right-hand side reinforcements, so after Ephraim and Erica team up for the kill on the right Draco Zombie across an enemy phase and then the next player phase, they have to retreat. The left-hand side one is very handily dispatched by a Garm crit from Gilliam, so Gilliam Gaming returns. The Cav Curse strikes again with Dussel overextending and dying. It takes its final cab as Seth kills a Gorgon while in range of Leon, who hits and kills him with Magalfar. Then, during the last player phase, Inez dies due to poison damage, which is absolutely hilarious. Moving Mur into ranged Garing to see the kill on Leon turns out to be absolutely useless owing to Ephraim getting a crit on him, meaning that all three of Dussel, Seth, and Leon died for naught. Anyway, in the second part of the finale, I save state, because frankly, I don't want to do the first part again, even if it means that I could have more people live, because living is cringe. After both Ephraim and Erica attack on auto, I learned that at least in this hack, the reinforcements are ambush spawns, for which I am punished. The second attempt, I do not attack and I'm not punished, though I'm very certain that Erica could have died if I was unlucky. The Demon King goes after Erica for a couple of turns to distract him, until all of Ephraim, Murr, and Garrick are able to team up for the kill. I did want Gilliam to get it to replicate some of the glorious Gilliam gaming in the FE8 Oops All Arches LTC, but alas, it was not to be. So, the FE8 auto chess run is complete with 5 units alive, the twins, Murr, Garrick, and Gilliam, aka the 2 units I got to control, and the grinded 2 unpromoted 20 Volney squad. None of the groups for cutscenes are all alive, which gives us this comically short post finale section before the credits roll. In terms of fun numbers and end cards, it took the AI, and a bit of me, 385 turns to clear the game, not including Volney's grinding time, which I did not document. Seth saw nearly 500 battles and over 350 wins, and one loss, clearly a bad unit. Gilliam saw nearly 300 battles and nearly 200 wins, and he seems to be becoming a staple of my FD8 runs. Noel had more losses than wins due to dying on both attempts of Scorched Sand. This is an honour later shared by Ewan, who died twice in Hamel Canyon. Dozla died at Tower of Volney 5, which is a real L. Garrick saw almost 250 battles and nearly 200 wins with zero losses, making both the unit with the highest win rate and the fewest deaths because he didn't die even in the first attempt to track 16. And Erica saw over 300 battles and only killed in around 125 of them, with a whopping 10 losses. So not everything bad that happened in this video was down to the AI. This run 
if you can call it that, was pretty entertaining, with a lot of despair for the AI. Towards the end, though, I do think that it became dramatically easier due to the existence of infinite use sacred twin weapons and the Dragonstone, meaning that chapters 20 and the endgame were much easier than they could have been. Still, I'm not complaining, because I did not want to have to fight all 157 enemies in chapter 20, including the reinforcements. Thank you to Vesley for making this incredibly funny hack, link in the description, and to you for watching. I wasn't entirely sure what to do with all this footage after the fact, and this is the first video I've done where I'd say I had to do a large amount of actually going through and editing down footage, so hopefully you enjoyed it. If you enjoyed it, please do consider subscribing if you haven't already, and equally if you didn't, please do let me know so I can work on improving any future videos. Once again, thank you for watching, and have a good one.